We're here today to uh, talk with Dr. DeBakey uh, about Dr. Rudolph Mattis, who lived from 1860 to 1957, dying at age 97. Dr. Mattis has become the symbol of vascular surgery in the South, and as such, was chosen as a symbol for Southern Association for Vascular Surgery, with his profile on the logo. He was a professor of surgery at Tulane from 1894, stepping down in 1927 to be succeeded by Dr. Alton Oshner. The interview today, or the discussion today, that we'd like to have regards uh, Dr. Mattis and, and how you knew Dr. Mattis, uh, Dr. DeBakey, and exactly what memories you might have of him. How, in fact, did you meet Dr. Mattis? Or how did you know Dr. Mattis? Well, I met him for the first time at his home at his invitation. I was uh, a medical student at the time, and uh, uh, I, uh, I would go to the library to get uh, journals that were uh, European journals, either in German or French. And uh, I did this largely as a, as a uh, means of translation for some of the faculty members who couldn't read uh, adequately German or French, and I could. And so it was um, a service that I provided. And uh, one day the, the librarian said to me uh, that Dr. Mattis would like for me to go get the books myself because he wanted to meet me. He wanted to know who this fellow was who was borrowing all of his journals. Uh, apparently uh, there had not been previously anybody that was borrowing so many of his journals. These books were in his home, in his library. As a matter of fact, his house was virtually a library, uh, which I found out when I got there. And so when I arrived, he uh, met me at the door, and I, I met a very, uh, a very portly gentleman who was, uh, <clears throat> had a goatee and uh, you know, graciously asked me to come in and then asked me to sit down with him in, the, in one of the rooms, which was part of his library, really. Uh, I later found out almost all the rooms had been converted into the library. In fact, they had to, uh, they had to add additional foundation support to the house. But we sat down and uh, then he wanted to know all about me. Wonder who my parents were, where I was from, where I was born, and so on. And what my education was, and so on. And, uh, and then he wanted to know, you know, why I was interested in his journals. Because uh, he, uh, he, he not only could read several languages, but spoke uh, French and Spanish, of course, and German, quite fluently. Uh, and he was very interested that he was a medical student, you know, he never hadn't, hadn't experienced that previously, a medical student who could read these journals so well. And I explained to him, you know, what I was doing, that I was translating these for some of the faculty members. He, uh, he offered me uh, something to drink and he said, Brian, will you have a, a, a little glass of port with me? He said, I like port. Well, I happened to, uh, I had a little difficulty with that, but uh, I made out like I was sipping it. I didn't. <laughs> because uh, I had grown up in a family that considered alcohol and tobacco a sin. So we didn't have any tobacco or alcohol in our family. But he didn't, didn't particularly notice that I was just sipping and not uh, drinking his port wine. He was very gracious. So after that, I had to go to his house to get the books, 
which uh, sometimes is kind of a nuisance because before I could have somebody go get them, I didn't have to do it myself. But it was nice to see him, you know, at home. He later, I found out when I started assisting Dr. Oxner, that he referred his patients to Dr. Oxner when they needed operation. Uh, and he would, he, he would follow the patients through, you know. It was always interesting. He wanted to, for example, in those days, most of the surgery was abdominal. It wasn't a great deal of thoracic surgery at that particular time. It came later, later. And uh, he would like to come in the operating room after the patient was anesthetized so he could feel the abdomen, you see, with the patient anesthetized and the ab abdominal wall pretty relaxed so he could get a better feel of things. <laughs> it was very interesting then, you know, he's he very thorough in the old fashioned examination. And I remember on one occasion we were getting ready to uh, operate on a patient of his. So he came. Uh, I had gone in to the operating room and prepared the patient, and then I had to come out and scrub again. And so he was washing his hands because he was wanting to go in there and uh, sort of feel the abdomen. And there was a swinging door between the, the scrub room and the operating room. And when he got to the swinging door, I noticed he took one finger and he pushed that door. <laughs> so, so he wouldn't get too contaminated. <laughs> uh, except this was a little bit relative then. <laughs> and I used to go to his, uh, he always invited me to his home because, on Mardi Gras, because when the parade went down St. Charles Avenue, the uh, king, you know, would stop and t have a toast at certain houses on St. Charles Avenue. And always when they got to his house, uh, the king would stop and have a and toast him. And so I, he, he always invited me to be at his home on Mardi Gras, which was very nice because that was a, one of the best ways to see it. See it. He was very, very uh, nice to me. And... Uh, when I got ready to leave, you know, he from here, he just missed me. He, uh, I wanted to say goodbye to him, so, and so I made an appointment and went over to his home. And he said, "You know, I'm glad you came because I was going to call you. I wanted you to, want you to do something for me." And I said, "Of course, I'd be glad to, Dr. Miles." He said, uh, come over here in this next room, so we moved into another room where he had a lot of papers on the table and uh, a trunk, one of these big, you know, steamer trunks. He opened that trunk and it was filled with papers. And he said, I'd like for you to take this trunk with you because I want you to finish what I started. Uh, he was asked by the New Orleans Medical Society, uh, to uh, prepare a history of the Louisiana Medical uh, Association and the medical activities in Louisiana, really from its origins. And like everything he, he, uh, he did, you know, he said to me, he said, I couldn't do that without doing a history of medicine in the United States, in America. <laughs> he had accumulated all the all the the uh, research reports that he had found about the history of medicine in America, and he hadn't yet finished the report. Now this was some uh, thirty forty years after he was appointed chairman to do this. <laughs> he was appointed chairman of a committee to do this, <laughs> and he hadn't completed it. And he said he was afraid that it might not be completed before he died. I have, I had the opportunity to be at a couple of meetings where he attended. And uh, I remember one of them was in, in uh, Cleveland uh, at a meeting of the American Surgical Association. And he got up to discuss a paper that was given by somebody, I've forgotten who, who, who it was at the time, 
But he got up to give a discussion of the man's paper, and he gave another paper. But he gave a much more thorough discussion of the subject than the man who gave the paper. <laughs> he was a great, uh, a great scholar. And uh, his writings, uh, if, you, if you read his writings, you realize what, what a scholarly person he was. He had a very graceful way of expressing uh, his prose, you know, was really uh, quite uh, scholarly and graceful, and you just enjoy reading it. His surgical skill, I, I don't know about, really, other than what I heard. Did you see him operating? Yeah, I saw him operating. He, when I, by the time I knew him, he had stopped operating completely. He was still seeing patients, though, in his office. And whenever they needed operation, he would refer to Dr. Oxen. One of the very interesting aspects of his interest in aneurysms and his description of his operative procedure is that he, uh, he knew the history very thoroughly. And, and you can't help but wonder if, if it wasn't from that knowledge that he developed the uh, procedure of endurance Because basically, the basic principles of his operation were pretty well described, except the procedure of endurance where he sewed together the, the walls of, of the aneurysm after having evacuated it. But the procedure of, of ligating the main artery above and below the aneurysm and opening it, and then suturing the opening of the collateral vessel was well described by both Antillus, who was a contemporary of Galen in around the first and second century AD, and a, and a, uh, a fellow by the name of Aida, some seven centuries after Antillus. A very, very detailed description of exactly what Mattis did, except that Mattis added the procedure of endoaneurysmography, which was to completely collapse that wall by sewing the edge, all the wall together. And that was a real trick, because you see, that took care of any leakage that might occur from the collaterals, and that obliterated it, the, the aneurysm. And then, you see, it never occurred to anybody at that time to resect and put a graph in. That didn't come about until much later. But at that, I'm going to see Madison's procedure was around 1880 something. Prior to that, in the, in the history, the recorded history, there no, uh, there was no consideration of resection and graft replacement. Uh, so that concept never was described previously. You know, is that interesting? Fascinating. Why do you believe that Dr. Mattis was so innovative? He came up with ideas about IV fluids, about nasogastric tubes, about endotracheal anesthesia, about using motion pictures for teaching. Why was this man so innovative? What was different? Well, for one thing, he had a great sense of curiosity. He, um, even when he was quizzing me about my my life and family and so on, he was he could see the curiosity. You see. And uh, he had, and, and if you read his writings, you you you, you get that uh, expression of curiosity. Um, even about the etiology of diseases other than surgical, he, he had a great sense of curiosity, and he was fascinated with. Uh, the idea of uh, maybe developing another new way of dealing with problems. 
Well, I, you, you, this is well expressed when, when you think of, of uh, what he did with his first endoaneurysm of the keys. What he had, this, this patient was, he first operated on this patient by ligating both above and below. And as he said, the aneurysm was stilled, you say, not pulsing anymore. But to his amazement, the next day when he came in to see the patient, aneurysm was pulsating again. So he said, you know, he was then curious as to why this happened. And he couldn't believe that his, his ligature had opened. So we went back in, see? And as, when he got back in, he found the ligatures were absolutely tight. There was no, no nothing wrong with that. But the thing was added, pulsated. Then he said he, the only way he's going to find out is by opening it up. And that's when he found the collaterals. See? And he said, and it, it was very interesting, he, he said, it became obvious to me as it would to any surgeon. But the thing to do now is to oversow the opening of these collateral vessels in the aneurysm wall. And, and to bring the, the, the two walls together so as to obliterate it completely. That was, that was the, that came to him as he was operating. That, that's innovative in a sense, but it's his curiosity that stimulated him to do that. What do you think his thoughts would be on endovascular surgery, specifically the aortic stent graft for aneurysm treatment? What would you think he would, how would he react to that now? Well, I think, I think his, uh, his reaction would be reasonably positive, although uh, he, you see, he, he never, he never did uh, he didn't live long enough to see the uh, full development of aortic surgery. And uh, the idea, most of his surgery, of course, with the exception of one case that he did, you remember, of an aneurysm down the aorta, which he ligated uh, successfully. <coughs> um, in fact, he was the first one to do it successfully. Dr. Mattis actually ligated the aneurysm proximal to the aneurysm, the aorta, and it was successful. And there must have been about uh, 30 or 40 cases all, all together after that that were successful. But he never, uh, you see, he, uh, See, the first aneurysm resection of the aorta with a graft replacement was in 52. Okay. And so I don't think he fully, you know, he wasn't aware of it. So I don't think he would understand that very much, the idea of, of, of a graft replacement. He knew about graft replacement for peripheral aneurysm, but not the aorta. And, uh, and his, you see, his understanding, his conceptual consideration for the treatment of aneurysm was to obliterate it. And you remember he had two types. One was the restorative endoaneurysm morphine, and the other was the obliterative. And the restorative mostly was in what we call psychoform aneurysm. The obliterative was almost entirely fusiform. I, 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 he, he was such a, a scholar, you know, in surgery, that he would be open-minded about it, and would be somewhat, I would say, uh, surprised, and maybe skeptical about its long-term value. And he may be right. <laughs> Um, uh, Professor, do you see similarities between Dr. Mattis and you as far as the, his attention and, and 
fascination with aneurysms and the fact that your gigantic impact on the management of this problem. Do you see the similarities here? That I well, I, 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 you know, I, I feel honored to have any uh, comparison with him because I admire him so much. Because I think he was a really one of the truly great uh, figures in, in surgery of his time. Dr. Devaki, I, I appreciate your time today and remembering these uh, fascinating aspects of Dr. Rudolph Mattis and the development of vascular surgery, particularly in the southern part of the United States. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you.